Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast Where we spin the jams and spill the tea uh, we are one down this week, as you will have already noticed. Jake was unable to join us this week, so it'll be a, a slightly reduced lineup. But we should still hopefully be able to deliver the entertainment factor that you're all <laughs> so uh, eager to get from us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, so today we're going to be reviewing uh, two new releases Touche Amore's album Lament and uh, mm-hmm. the noise rock band Nets's album. Uh, Atlas Vending, uh, and then if once you have watched this, you can click over to our Record Club review this week, which for which we are going to be joined by uh, the fantastic uh, Zach. I was going to say the fantastic <laughs> Zask Mo because I'm just so used to <laughs> writing his thing out. Um, yeah, yeah. So so we're going to be joined by our uh, friend of the pod Zach, who has joined us in the past to discuss Smash Mouth's Astro Lounge. Uh, which will uh, no doubt be a soul-sucking experience. Um, but let's. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, this is the after this and be fart. This is the last time I recommend an album because it will be interesting, but not necessarily good. Yes. So let's jump okay. into um, our. Well, first of all, let's kick off with as we usually do with our regular segment on what we have been listening to in the past Indeed. seven days. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, Amsentee um, order. Amsentee yeah. order. So August, do you want to kick us off? What have you been? Watching? Yeah, why not? So this week, uh, because I was in it, unable to formally talk about it last week, mainly because I was uh, not feeling up to it, I listened to uh, Gestas '96, of course, by Noisy Todd. I co-signed with pretty much everything that was said in that. Uh, lovely review uh if you're listening to this i look forward todd to your further uh musical trajectory i know his name isn't todd it's, yeah, it's just, just funny, funny. <laughs> yeah, discussion in the episode about the fact that i kept thinking his name was todd as well while I was mr no. noisy 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 todd is, noisy. A great, is a great rap name and i could see why he chose noisy todd yeah as well. Jack. Um, okay, so continuing on, I of course spent a considerable amount of time with Autekers XI, their oh, yes. final record that I had to listen to before I wanted to go into Sign, which we are reviewing next week. Correct. And uh, XI is my favorite Autekers album now. I think it is a brilliant summation of their entire career. Every sound they did in the past is present on here with plenty of newer ideas as to keep it fresh. For a two-hour album, it is worth your time. Uh, yeah. Uh, next up, uh, mm, from the band Over, I listened to their album Shadows of the Sun, a uh, kind of weird ambient electronic album that has lyrics i i enjoyed it a lot it was very uh very good to listen to while doing a lot of homework that's kind of my thoughts there uh then the pixies is bossa nova which is now my favorite pixies album uh i love the change in kind of sonic their kind of stylistic shift away from what they did on doolittle keeping still their signature kind of personality. It's it's just lovely. Uh, you got to check it out. And finally, what I listened to was the debut EP from a band I've been hyping up a lot, uh, Shinsei Kamate-chan's Tomodachi Wo Kuroshite Made. I'm butchering that pronunciation most definitely. No, that was and actually I, pretty good throughout. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and anyways, that EP is stellar. I think not quite as good as their first album, but I think it is still definitely worth checking out if you want to hear the sonic trajectory of said band. And uh, yeah, that was my week. Sick. 
I'll have to listen to that EP because I really liked the album that we. Uh, that yeah, we it's uh, like thirty minutes long, <laughs> so nice and sh- short and sweet. Good stuff, uh, Morgan. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> in continuing a trend, apparently on these main episodes, I just listened to an entire band's discography. And that's what I listened to this week. That being the band that we're covering, Touche More. Um, All right. I had not I had not heard uh, "To the Beat of a Dead Horse" or "Is Survived By," and I had not uh, I'd heard "Parting the Sea" between uh, is it lightness in me? Right. I don't, I, brightness. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd heard that once, but I didn't really remember it, and I wanted to re-listen to Stage Four again. Um, I think those first three records are very strong eight out of tens and stage four is like the strongest of nines. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, just one of the most remarkably consistent post hardcore groups working today, maybe the most consistent. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good stuff. Yes. uh, Very good. And we'll talk about that some more very soon. Indeed. Um, that's about between Porter's head and the main listens. I did not have time for much else this week. Yeah, so yeah, just to give context to our listeners, we also just a few days ago recorded an episode in which we yeah. um, broke down the three album discography of Porter's head. Uh, that will be up. Uh, if you're watching this on Sunday, that'll be up uh, at some time in the next few days as well. Yeah, okay. On this subject though, um, this is record store slash cafe on my local high street that I go into semi regularly, um, and they've never had Porter said ever. Um, and I walk in, and literally on the first shelf, staring me in the fucking face, the morning after we record our Porter yeah. said episode was this. Sick. Wait. Yeah. I said, well, that, I was said good man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they they look a bit different to how I remember August and your your yeah, picture. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder why that might be. Um, hmm. Yeah, sick. All right. Um, so is it, so is that everything Morgan listened to this week? Yeah. Sure. Right. So I'm gonna cram in one segment. I listened to six Mountain Goats albums this week uh, to just for upcoming content. Having all eternal stack, transcendental youth, beat the champ, uh, goths in League of Dragons and songs for Pierre Chauvin. Um, I'm not going to tell anyone what I thought of them until we record, until I put out the, what I'm making about them. Um, but also, um, this is in no relation to what Jake did on the Idols episode. I just had this queued up anyway. But I listened to Brave Faces Everyone by Spanish Love Songs, um, which was a fucking masterpiece. It's one of the best uh, sort of. Uh, kind of pop punky emo albums I've heard in a very very long time. Reminded me a lot of the Wonder Years, who I love. Um, yeah, brought me back to seeing the Wonder Years actually for the first time. I hadn't really listened to them. I was covering for a friend who was writing in a music magazine at the time, that, um, and I went to review one of their gigs, and I love them from that day onwards. And I was brought back to that listening to Brave Faces, everyone. Yeah. Um, another. Jake Cole sort of emo inflected record that I listened to this week was Four of Arrows uh, by Great Grandpa. Yes, Tyler Core also. Yes, and from now on, Social Core, I think. Um, yeah, that was those records. I was so like vindicating seeing that uh, full five stars you gave that record. It's because it's very good. Um, <laughs> Ah, oh, God. Um, again, just it's uh, probably more sonically diverse than Great Faces, everyone. Um, yeah. But they're both equally just astounding to me. Just so well written on a lyrical level, so well structured, and, and performed with such passion and emotion. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Fucking loved it. Uh, so that's three. I listened to Goo by Sonic Youth. Um, there's another Sonic Youth record I intend to listen to this week. Um, that was wanting to listen to anyway, but I loved Goo. Um, yeah. I mean, look, it's Goo by Sonic Youth. What do you want from me? It's great. Um, yeah. It's good. Uh, good, yeah. Um, and yesterday, I listened... To, I, I've listened to other records this week, but um, yesterday I listened to Tom Waits' Mule Variations. Um, 
<laughs> which is allegedly Tom Waits' best record. <laughs> I mean, it's my favorite, but it's, you yeah. know, it's Tom Waits, top tier Tom Waits, regardless. You yeah, say. no, absolutely. I thought it was excellent. Um, I thought maybe some tracks were a bit more redundant in the track list than on other Tom Waits records, but I still think it is absolute top tier music all around. It's probably my yeah. third favorite Tom Waits. And if you know how much I love uh, Rain Dogs, which it's beating out, you know that what well, that's a minor complaint. Yeah. Um, I thought it was fucking excellent. Um, I still think Bone Machine and Real Gone, I prefer. But it's honestly, when you're getting to that tier of record, it's subjective completely. Um, yeah. And I've talked about three records, actually, that are going to be upcoming album clubs in the next few months. So that's fun. Yeah. On, the, on my way home from, from work yesterday, I, I just like... I just randomly threw on. Uh, I didn't really have time to listen to all of Mule Variations, but I put. I, I decided to listen to "Come On Up to the House," which is my favorite song on that record, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is just such a, an amazing closing track. It's 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 so beautiful and moving, and basically like like Tom's just kind of ushering you into this place of like peace and and mm. and rest and and like where you don't have to fucking worry about anything anymore. It's like. It's gorgeous, and I adore that song so much. And the whole album is just emblematic of that feeling. And, yeah. and I do, I just, I love it. Yeah, I won't disagree. It's a great song. Um, I think probably the one that stuck with me the most um, is House Where Nobody Lives. Yeah. Uh, it's such a good song, too. I, yeah. Just, but the closer is excellent. Almost, almost every song on the record is a 10. So, fantastic. It's, great, it's a great record. Cool. Uh, was there any? Was it? Was it? Was it all the ones you wanted? Those to were five okay. segments. Cool. So I had a, a really awesome week, listing-wise, in terms of discovering records that I would come to love. Uh, so the first one I want to shout out is uh, I am continuing my journey through the through the oeuvre of uh, Herbie Hancock, um, legendary jazz musician and fusion artist. I listened to his album Sextant, uh, which is uh amazing uh it's probably it's it's i still haven't listened to headhunters yet that's the next album i've got but but so far i've listened to almost everything he's done up to this point and so far it's a close call between sextant and empyrean isles for his masterpiece but both of them are just amazing albums incredible jazz records sextant i was really taken aback by because it is it has like the way it utilizes electronic, uh, early electronic equipment, because this record came out in 1972. And so it, it incorporates a lot of electronic um, sounds and textures. It reminds me weirdly of Orteker uh, in parts, not the whole record, specifically the first track does. Uh, it even, and not even like idm early Orteker. Like it, it specifically reminds me of like XI era Orteker, which is so strange to hear in a fusion record. Um, but that's just the electronic elements. It's a really kind of weird and dissonant and, and, but also fun and funky album. Uh, super, super creative stuff. Like Herbie Hancock was one of the gods of, of jazz and, and I just adore his stuff. So that was a real fun discovery. Um, I also listened to uh, Richard Dawson's Peasants, which is a kind of like prog folk concept record about life in medieval england uh and i have to say this is a perfect album it's weird and and it has a lot of strange sort of key changes and and chords and and the but the songwriting is just so good like it's incredibly moving songwriting it weirdly reminded me of like uh the songs were like ben wheatley movies uh I don't really know exactly why it reminded me of, of Ben Wheatley, <laughs> like, but just the way, just the whole approach to kind of like fractured, weird character studies, like the whole thing felt like a field in England, but like in audio form, except there was like narratives. So I was like, I don't know. It just, it's, it's also, it's just like incredibly, incredibly English. Um, that's probably another element of it, but it's all, it's just such a, um, interesting and and varied album that goes to so many places instrumentally and musically you would just not expect uh, a folk album to go to um and so definite emphasis on the prog aspect of the prog folk label 
uh, amazing album, easy 10 out of 10. I also listened to Opeth's Ghost Reveries, uh, which was a transformative experience. Uh, me and Jake listened to it uh, sort of simultaneously. Um, and like I came away from it feeling as though it's probably right of the second, my favorite Opeth album. Although that's a really difficult call to make because uh, at this point I've given four of their records perfect scores and, and they're basically all interchangeable. Um, but I really dug um, the denser aspects of, of, of Ghost Reveries. It really went to some like places I didn't expect it to, but it managed to be incredibly beautiful um, the whole way through in that process. Uh, so that's just a stunning record. Definitely one of my favorite metal albums. Um, I also uh, listened to that's three records I've shouted out. I think I also shout out. I listened to um, a kind of like free jazz noise album from 1968 called Machine. Excuse me. It's called it's called Machine Gun. Uh, it's by an artist called Peter Brotsman. Um, and it's like, it, cause we discussed, uh, Coltrane's Ascension not too long ago. Uh, and this album is kind of like continuing in the vein of that, except it's taking it like so much further into the, into the, uh, away from the, um, conventions of jazz and more into the conventions of noise music. Like the, um, the horns on this record are played like industrial instruments, uh, it's very violent, sort of filled with these kind of screeching, screaming sounds coming out of these jazz instruments. Uh, it's very kind of like almost music concrete or like avant-garde. Um, but if you dig like that kind of weirder, more far out uh, aspects of free jazz, you'll probably dig Machine Gun. Um, and what else do I want to shout out? Oh, yesterday I listened to um, Cat Power, her album Moon Picks. So it's kind of like uh, indie folk slash rock. Well, not really rock, but like indie folk slow core. So like uh, it's, it's, I don't really know what, if it, if it will have an appeal to the people on this podcast, but it's very, it's very much kind of like moody, uh, incredibly poetic and, and tastefully written uh, indie folk music with a real kind of sad edge to it. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's definitely just stands out from the pack in terms of like, there are lots of kind of sad indie girl folk records, but this just feels like the work of someone who is world weary and has lived a life of like re real trial, even though she was only like in her twenties when she recorded this. It's really like incredibly uh, affecting in a way that feels like heavy uh, emotionally. And I really dug that. Um, and yeah, that's what I listened to this week. Nice. So, so uh, I think, yes. So we let's get into our, our main reviews. So the first album we're going to review is Touche Amore's Lament. And in terms of introduction, I was going to ask Morgan, if since you've been listening to a lot of their music, um, do you want to sort of introduce the band, the context for the record, and you can even do your review if you want to first. I don't really mind. Uh, probably won't do the review first. Um, right, but sure. up to you. Yeah. Touche Amore are a uh, post-hardcore emo alt rock thing. <laughs> they're, I think they're I think they're a quintet uh, from Southern California, maybe. I think I'm I'm fairly certain they're from California. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I think their I think their first record to the beat of a dead horse was. 10 11 years ago now that sounds right mm -hmm. um yeah yeah they, they but they've been releasing just really emotionally evocative intense short but sweet post hardcore records since then um just a super consistent group and all of this sort of came to a head in was staged for 2016 yes yeah right okay um, all of this sort of came to a head in what really felt like a moment for the band with the release of Stage 4, which is what most people seem to consider their best work. Um, it definitely felt like 
the band operating at the height of their powers. And uh, it also deals heavily with the death of the lead singer, Jeremy Bohm's mother, um, which is where the title comes from and is what yeah. much of the record is based around his loss and his experience with grief. And it's, uh, it's a harrowing listen, but it's always like, it's more cathartic than anything. Um, yeah, really, really incredible record. And uh, this sort of puts Lament in a bit of an awkward position with following up like, you know, the 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 master of puppets of Touche Amore's career thus far. Um, it's just kind of always an awkward space to be in when you're following up what many perceive to be your best work. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, proud. Um, so I guess I'll leap on that then. Um, I liked this record quite a bit. I thought it was a very satisfying listen. I like the way the, as Morgan has sort of implied there, done before, blended sort of post hardcore with sort of emo sounds um, uh, and very emotionally resonant lyrics. Um, it's hardly writing about your, your, your mother dying, your cancer, emotional, but uh, the way the, he writes about lyric, uh, relationships and, and depressions here, um, I found quite compelling. Um, the song Reminders, which is the fourth track, uh, even goes into these very almost like sugary, sweet choruses, um, shouting, I need reminders of the love I had. You know, um, I put my chin up in photographs. Another way to reinvent the past. Uh, those folks have particularly caught my eye. And, you know, I have a sort of musical heritage in appreciating emo music, and that moment particularly hit those buttons. But those moments are, are all over the record. Um, the song Limelight with the Manchester Orchestra uh, almost hits a sort of brand new era, Golden Devil type beat. Um, and it was sort of starts off with a sort of haunting alt rock guitars with a very threatening bass and it explodes into the chorus of lyrics like I'm tired and sore, which I think many people can appreciate at this time in world history. Um, even then, the album opens with the uh, the opening scream from Peaks and from uh, Peaks of, of Blue, Calm Heroin, before it blasts into the rest of the song. And uh, it was sort of the tone setter for the album in a way. It's not one of my favorite songs on the album, but it sets the tone very nicely, and it then goes into Lament, which I did enjoy very much. Um, you had these sort of faraway screamings of, uh, I have it till I forget, till um, I reset. Um, yes, um, it doesn't, though, I think, across the album, quite have the musical punch that I want from this album, which is sort of in the production, but then again, Maybe that's a good thing. Is the album trying to hold me at a bit of arm's length with the production here? Sounding a bit more spacey, a bit more reverby. Um, but then some of the musical choices in terms of how they play, their, their, their performances, their chord choices, that is going much more from an aggressive punch you in the face rock feeling. I feel like there's a disconnect there, but maybe it's intentional. I can see it working for some other people. Um, uh, yeah, uh, what else do I think about the record? Um, I'll Be Your Host, um, lovely ballad to the disease of COVID-19. I'm joking, of course. Um, I thought it was a pretty good song with a pretty sweet melodic line. Um, and the closer, A Forecast, is my favourite song on the record. A fucking stunning ballad of uh, humour and emotional intensity and sweet melodies, uh, probably the most outwardly emo focused moment on the record talks about finding the patience of a jazz still loving the coen brothers is a line that made me chuckle even though it's not like the coen brothers particularly like lowbrow um but you know it, it made me laugh um yeah uh um i've healed more than i've suffered being the line before that a very key line on the song um it's a really great way yeah. to end the record and you end the record feeling uh, satisfied with what you've heard before, um, with that song ending, tying up with a nice bow, a sort of emotional thesis of the record. Um, so, overall, uh, the, 
the Frank Sorry. Turner's jet lag of uh, of this album. That's a great uh, comparison. I'm yeah, I love it. Of it. Uh, and with jet lag, it's also one of my favorite Frank Turner songs. To make a top ten, that as, song would be as in it, it should be. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, intimation. This record slaps. I imagine it slapped slightly less than previous two Shea Mori records. Um, but I enjoyed it. I wish I had gotten more of a visceral experience from it and less of an intellectual one. Okay. Well, I might jump on that if you want, because I think I've dug into a, the record a little bit more and I might be able to add a little bit more in, in terms of what is actually the songs are actually about and what's the record's going for. I also have some interesting counterpoints to some of the opinions that have been expressed already. Uh, one mm. being that... Uh, up until this point, uh, I actually think that for as emotionally powerful and potent as stage four was, I actually found it less instrumentally and musically interesting than the records that had come before it. Uh, that said, I didn't think it was like a major step down musically or anything like that. I just felt that it lacked the punch that something like is survived by has, which incidentally is survived by a, is and still remains uh, my favorite Touche Amore record uh, because I think it blends that real kind of raw emotionality and then deeply personal kind of like airing of um, of feelings and and it and it channels it through that real kind of pristine uh, post hardcore screamo sound and it does it consistently and the songwriting is just excellent. Um, stage four is a very different beast. Uh, and, and I, as much as I appreciate, I think the writing on stage four is amazing. And, and there's some real genuinely moving moments, like when he alludes to, um, you know, being scared to listen to his mother's final voicemail to him. And then ended up playing it at the very end of the album is just, oh, oh, my heart. Um, but I was very curious to see musically where they would go with Lament, uh, and topically as well, because it's difficult to kind of follow up a record where you get a lot of attention for this for the singular focus of it. Um, and I have to say, I'm considering those expectations, I'm pretty pleased with Lament. I think it's a really, really solid record. Uh, I, I don't think it's right at the, the top tier level of, of their best stuff, uh, but I do appreciate the fact that instrumentally, um, they're still kind of looking for new shades to their sound and, and some, some of the new shades feel kind of more appropriate here than, than they did on stage four. And I'll, I'll kind of try and hopefully explain uh, what I mean. Uh, uh, that I, I really dig uh, reminders as, as Sush has already mentioned is basically like an anthem for the year. And we've had a lot of songs and a lot of albums this year, as we have talked about ad infinitum that have kind of tried to mine the, emotional turmoil of the year and then summarize it reminders i think benefits from i mean all of these songs i believe were written before the pandemic anyway um but uh and i think reminders specifically was written uh following trump's sort of failed impeachment proceedings mm. i think uh and that's where the inspiration came from so there's actually kind of more political inspiration behind this but thankfully they don't really kind of dig into politics too much on this record it's more about the emotion uh and, and reminders is beautiful anthem it doesn't wallow in the sadness it rebels against it in a really beautiful way uh i dig the backing vocals on the track from julian baker uh and and Sush has already alluded to the, alluded to this line but it's my favorite uh lyric on the record uh i tilt my chin up in photographs a subtle way to reinvent the past i i just find that really a, a quite a beautiful and striking sentiment um you can kind of distill a moment but you can you can make the the emotional tone the 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 history of that moment you can change it through some through your actions and 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 through the way you memorialize it and i i i really love that um uh i really also find uh limelight to be a, a big standout uh it's a tribute i believe to jeremy's dogs who who passed away during the process of writing and recording the song um, so it has um, an uplifting tone to it, but it's also a bittersweet tone. Uh, uh, and and oh, the, I wasn't expecting uh, Andy Hull of Manchester Orchestra to come in on this track, but as soon as he did, it was like I felt my eyes watering because he just has one of those voices um, that does that, especially with how much I love the, the last Manchester Orchestra album. 
Uh, Manchester Orchestra B-sides win. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Uh, very much a band in the same vein emotionally uh, as like your your frightened rabbits and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's good. The song has a very cathartic climax, which I really love, like the way it builds and builds and builds. I believe um, the whole idea for that climax was actually uh, suggested by the records producer, Rob Ross Robinson. Uh, that also is a fact I think worth mentioning. I'm sure Morgan will mention it as well. This is a record produced by Ross Robinson, legendary uh, sort of metal and uh, heavy music producer. Uh, and and uh, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but a pleasantly great fit for this band. Um, and definitely adds a lot to the sound of the record that I love. Uh, I also uh, really, I really dig uh, the exit row is really aggressive and driving, but it also has these kind of splashy and reverbed guitar tones that line the verses, adds a kind of softness that balances the heaviness, gives it a fuller feel. I love that. I love the way the song flows right into savoring, which is another big highlight on the record for me. Uh, it has these gorgeous and really emotive ringing guitar chords at the center of the song that I just find really, really, yeah, just they get my blood pumping. Um, uh, and topically, it deals with kind of spiraling in the absence of having a center, something to center you, like a loved one or a passion or something, just kind of being lost. Uh, and it's quite a moving uh, evocation of that. Um, it's not until you get to I'll Be Your Host, where Jeremy seems to directly actually address the effect that the loss of his mother in the long term, and also more specifically, the channeling of that into their previous album, what effect that has had on him. Uh, as an artist, as a person, having to deal with, um, I think, I believe what the title actually refers to is um, the many times in which Jeremy has been kind of accosted by fans at shows and on Twitter saying like, oh, my, my mother, my father, my partner died and, and, and your, your album helped me kind of get through that. And just kind of the burden that, that Jeremy has felt having to have so much grief unloaded onto him by hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, that has made uh, the process of living since that record um, difficult. And it's, he kind of gets that across in a beautiful way in this song. I know it's something he's spoken about many times in interviews. Um, so the song captures it uh, really beautifully. Um, the song Deflector, I think, is superb. Classic Touche Amore. It's their intense brand of melodic post-hardcore. It's the track on here that most reminds me of kind of earlier eras of the band. Uh, it's very affecting. I really dig that. Um, that said, there are moments on the record that don't quite uh, work for me as well as others. Uh, I'm not so keen on the moments uh, in terms of singing where Jeremy really leans into a direct melody and in individual syllables. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically on the title track where he sings, uh, so I lament, then I forget. It just feels a bit clunky the way that that is delivered and his screams. I like it better when he's kind of really, um, when the, the, what he's singing has a bit more meat to it. Um, so that track kind of felt a bit flat to me. Uh, I also wasn't, uh, I, I like the sentiment of, of the song Fane, which deals with the pressure of being a writer for whom people connect emotionally in an intense way. This line, do I die a little less often if I feign profound? Uh, like, you know, find trying to use your art i think to kind of transcend your pain but kind of realizing that it might be uh in itself like a a, a pointless task uh I, I i thought that was a good sentiment it's musically though it wasn't as keen on the song um the piano intro of a forecast i think is a really nice touch um uh that said uh this closing track i'm not really won over and by the earring of personal grievances on it, it feels, I, I hate to say this, it feels a little cheap, uh, even though there's a definite honesty to it. And it's a real kind of like Jeremy's bearing how he feels like specifically he's talking about how his friends and band mates kind of failed to support him uh, in the wake of his mother's death and, and basically just generally calling out people who are sitting there in the room with him at the time. And that's kind of quite confronting. And, and I just, it feels a little bit, it's definitely something that I understand him needing to do, but as a listener, me, I feel really uncomfortable listening to that uh, in a way that doesn't kind of feel musically rewarding. But that said, it is also, it also becomes moving when 
after that airing of grievances and that you know solo piano verse the band then kind of come in um to support him in the second half of the song i think that development is is quite moving um uh I, I, I think the closing lyric, the repeated line of I'm still out in the rain, I could use a little shelter now and then. It's a little blunt. Uh, I, I feel like Jeremy's a talented writer. He could have written something a little less cliche to get that point across, I think. But still, uh, even when utilizing a kind of writing that I don't quite love, the sentiment and the truth of the emotion is still sold. So it, it doesn't really bug me too much. Um, so yeah, overall, I have a few reservations about this record, but I dig the the, ex- the the expansion of the sound. I think that it's uh, a solid way of following up um, stage four without kind of lingering in stage four too much. Um, and I dig the record quite a bit. Nice, nice. Um, August, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was about to say I was presuming that you wanted to go last, so I will go right ahead. So yeah, we got this uh, yeah Touch Amore, a, uh, <laughs> a band with who uh, is uh, uh-huh. fixated on their defining ethos of physical contact with the uh, creator of Watchmen. Uh, so the opener, yeah, uh, Come Heroin, I think, was a very nice immediate track recounting uh, kind of a relationship where you find yourself very dependent on someone else to keep you grounded. I think the just the production of this album, I'm personally a huge fan of this being by uh, Ross Robinson, I believe his name is, who also produced most notably uh, at the drive-ins relationship of command and uh wow. less notably uh deftones is adrenaline uh but hey wait did he produce that yeah he, he did. did wow well he did wow. he didn't he didn't produce the whole thing he has credits on a few select songs yeah that's this yeah but i can 100 yes. percent see the connection production style with relationship of command there yeah, like, but yeah, I think that production style of giving these instruments a very gorgeous yet kind of almost ringing, I guess, sound. I I find his production just very interesting, and I think it really complemented the emotional tone of this album quite well, and served, I think, as a really good juxtaposition to the passionately screamed vocals which have a much kind of more jagged quality to them than the instrumental palettes presented here and i also i also found like yeah tracks like lament also have a very distinctive sound to them kind of sounding very ringing and full i i love the sound of this album is, is my main point and a lot of these songs feature uh, Jeremy Holm, the lead singer, yeah, the, uh, contemplating his kind of success, past and, and future. And I think Tyler made a lot of really good points about the lyricism here, about how a lot of it, I think, comes across very, Tyler and Serge, I should say, uh, a lot of it comes across very strong, impactful, and potent, but is it, it is... Completely frozen? Okay. Yeah, but I think at times it can be a bit bogged down and some of the writing not being as, like, interesting as uh, it could have been. Like, Tyler even stole an exact example I had, the uh, standing out in the rain line from the closing track, which, while I do think that's a great moment, you already made the point, so I won't make it again. My bad. Stole your thunder. Ah, uh, no, you're fine. And Sersha's here twice now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well. Weird, weird when she first appeared and it was like the same <laughs> twice. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay. Good. That, that, that was like something out of a sci-fi movie. Yeah. <laughs> so I am the unfriended. Sorry. Um, 
Please continue, yes. August. Continuing on, I find the album's hardest hitting material for me is relegated to the bookends of the album. I thought I personally found the middle of it to not be as compelling as the kind of booking the ending bits of this album because I thought the middle just instrumentally it seemed to glide into it itself in a way that I didn't find as like immediately satisfying and impactful on an individual basis. Uh, granted, I did think the song uh, Savoring had some really fun kind of drum fills built in across it. And I think the album then from uh, then I think uh, song Broadcast, I find that so that track quite at least that's where I feel the monotony of that middle starts to break up and I get really engaged in the album again. Although that track, I do think uh, Tyler, I believe also talked about that to a good degree and yeah, moving on though, I'll Be Your Host, I think stands out as one of the album's best tracks, if not the best. Uh, I really loved the kind of narrative progression in this song using the colors of a ribbon to signify passage of time going from pink to black. I thought that was really a uh, nice narrative device, really clever. And I loved kind of this, the way the track was this both reflection in the past and future as I see the dichotomy of this album primarily being. And yet Deflector, uh, another great song kind of about uh, self-imposed social isolation. Really enjoyed that. And uh, A Forecast, the album's closer, I thought was quite crushing. Um, there's, I love the way this, al this song kind of strips itself back, as Tyler's already made a great point of. And... Uh, the line here that really got me was, I've lost uh, more family, I've lost fam more family to uh, the GOP than cancer, something like that. It's it's better in the album than I just expressed it. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah, know what I'm talking um, about. You really sold it there. You know what I'm talking about though, right? Yeah, I do. Yes. I do. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Good. But that, that moment I did really love that line. I loved kind of how it felt not so one dimensional in a political sense of like just uh, because my family is Republican, I feel there were other ways to interpret it beyond just that, like maybe just you could take it more, uh, I'll, I'll give up, this is not <laughs> going as well as I expect. But anyways, uh, yeah, this, I just think, uh, the way that track has that final cathartic burst, the band comes in, it's nice. I like I like it. Uh, yeah, that's the album. Enjoyed it a fair bit. Good stuff. Word. Um, I, I fully expected everybody to like this album um, a fair bit. I also expected either me or Jake to be the people who like it the most. Um, I don't really know what Jake think, thinks, but uh, it was. I think it was. <clears throat> <clears throat> I always thought it was going to be one of the two of us, and uh, at least of the four of us here now, it's definitely me. Um, <laughs> I, I am. I am somehow not shocked. Yeah, yeah I'm not I, shocked I, too. I don't think anyone would be. Um, I don't think it's. It would be unfair to say that Touche Amore have gotten slowly more melodic as the years have gone on um stage four had plenty of moments like new halloween where that basically just felt like sort of raucous alt rock tracks um and that's that's of course not to say that they uh, abandoned the post hardcore sound because they didn't and they haven't here either um but they're sort of I think they're finally doing sounds that make them wholly unique to them. I feel like, like I feel like the stuff off of the first three records, more the first two, um, 
I mean, like, it was always really, really good post-hardcore, but it also could have been by a lot of other bands in similar veins that were making music at that time. And um, the only thing that I felt made uh, made those records truly stand out from the pack is that Jeremy Bohm is a great writer. Um, and I, th- I definitely think that's... Uh, that's stage four's biggest selling point is just that the 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 writing on that album is pretty much you know world shatteringly good at every turn and uh i think they very much keep up the strength of that writing on lament um without you know sort of mining the same emotional uh areas as they did on stage four it still feels fresh and interesting and insightful in new ways i feel like you you get to know jeremy and the band more and more as these albums come out and the more you dig into them um i just really value the emotional honesty of this record and stage four um even when it is blunt um like the the line about rain at at the uh the the last repeated line in a forecast um i get uh thinking it's a bit cliche and that jeremy could have written something better and i would probably agree if it weren't for the nature of the song being so sort of stripped back and you know no facades and like it just it just feels like a moment where he just has to be honest about the way he feels despite you know the fact that it isn't necessarily very clever or poetic or new it just feels like a very honest moment that i liked a lot um to you know if if you've been around a while it would not surprise you to know that i'm a pretty big fan of uh ross robinson and he, yeah he's, he's doing some good work here. Um, Not even just in the sound of the record, but from everything I've read uh, that Jeremy has talked about, uh, he's expressed that Robinson was continuously expressing uh, that Bohm and everybody else sort of get as emotional as possible, get as much emotion out of the, the text and subtext as they could and i feel like that's really i think that's felt on the record um because they easily could have taken a step back from the emotional intensity of something like stage four and uh they chose not to which is a decision i respect especially considering that they're not just retreading ground here um but the record itself does sound very good um the Sersha's point about how it didn't quite have the impact that you would want from a record like this. I, uh, I respect it, but it ain't me. Um, (laughs) uh, this just, especially in the moments where it gets a little more melodic, like the chorus of, uh, reminders and, uh, I'll be your host are the two instances I think of, um, where the just absolutely soars, um, but it still maintains the the punchiness of a hardcore record. Uh, and most of that, I feel, is down to Balm's delivery. Um, I think this is the best that he's ever sounded on a record, especially like on Come Heroin. Sounds amazing. Um, just blisteringly intense, um, which is not something new to the band, but I think it's especially strong here. Um, yeah, I, in terms of drawbacks, um, just small things that I think need to be tightened up. Um, I was of the opinion that Touche Amore had never made a perfect record or a 10 out of 10 record up to this point, and I still believe that. Um, I think both... I think Lament definitely had the capacity to be that record, but they're 
things that have already been elaborated on by others that I, I sort of tend to agree with that I think could have been tightened up and altered a little bit maybe um, or just gone in different directions with. Uh, but yeah, I think this is an immensely, immensely strong record probably my second favorite of theirs uh, behind stage four and I will be coming back to it quite often as the, as the uh, throughout the, the remainder of the year yeah right. it's always good to hear and I think uh, that's everyone yep. yeah what, what's yeah. good and, and well thought out responses to this record yeah. well done team yeah. All right. favorite so, tracks and rating so i yeah. suppose i'm first yep you are yeah yeah we'll do reverse jams into order for the next one but for this Indeed. one we'll just do regular so my three favorite tracks are um i would have to go with i'll be your host um oh a forecast and come heroin, my least favorite would be. I guess I'll throw on uh, Exit Row, and I am giving this album a seven out of ten. Lush. There we Wonderful. go. Wonderful. Uh, my three favorites are "I'll Be Your Host," which I think is probably just my favorite song. The band has done up to this point. Um, let me say Exit Row and Reminders as the other two. Uh, least favorite uh, is Fane. I would say I do think the writing of that track is especially strong, but uh, sonically I don't find it as compelling as much of the other stuff on the album. And I'm feeling a, 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 a 9 out of 10. Oof, oof. Oof, we'd love to see it. Um, my three favorite tracks: a forecast, um, lament, and reminders. Do I have, or well, not a broadcast, a forecast? Um, and do I have least favorite track? No, not really. I like all the songs, but maybe either Come Heroin or Savoring. They're both good. And I'm feeling a seven and a half on this album. Cool biscuits. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Savoring, um, Deflector, and Limelight. Uh, my least favorite track is uh, either a broadcast or a forecast. I'll go with a broad- <laughs> I'll go with a broadcast since that track is just not memorable at all. Uh, it's bad takes. It's bad takes here. Uh, but I, I will still give the album a seven out of ten. <laughs> Neat. Okay. It's amazing. Right. I think the th- I think the three of you feel exactly, especially Sergio, that you feel exactly the way I do about this next album. So uh, now we'll move on to our second review for the day, uh, which is uh, uh, of the new uh, Mets album, Atlas Vending. So Mets are a noise rock band. Uh, They've been around for most of the last 10 years. Uh, this is their fourth album. Uh, they Their first two albums, yeah. They're like a, yeah. They're, it's a, they're a fairly easy <laughs> measure of. Um, they're, they just make loud, noisy rock music uh, that kind of you can put on in the car and just fucking blare till your fucking ears bleed like what I did with their second album in high school, which is awesome still their best record to date in my opinion um and and they've never really kind of sought to make their sound particularly complex or expansive it's just very much a a simple and effective slice of 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 cutting noise rock and so i'll dig into my review of this record specifically um uh, it's basically, yeah, this is just Mets doing what they do best. It's it's hard hitting, it's scuzzy, it's distorted, and it has a primal and melodically straightforward quality to it. But what really sells it, I think, is, the, is just how unhinged and raucous it is in delivery. 
Uh, I just put it, you can put a Mets record on, and this is no exception, and just absolutely go bananas. Uh, it is admittedly a limited sonic niche that they have carved out for themselves, but like I said, they deliver it with gusto. And, and while this new record, Atlas Vending, doesn't quite hit the hooky heights of their first two, which benefited, I think, from having mostly quite short tracks that were focused around hooks, kind of like if, if Pup weren't emo and just screamed instead of singing, um, <laughs> it's kind of what those first two records are like, and it's, they, they rule. Um, uh, and, and the, but the new record is also a more focused and accessible effort than their last record, which was Strange Peace in 2017, which had its moments, but I was not really into all that much, to be honest. It felt a little bit like treading water in an uninspired way, um, and it kind of sank ultimately under its own weight. Um, but Atlas Vending, I think, finds a little bit more vitality than that record had. It sees the band kind of pushing forward a little bit. There's a little bit more ambition, a tiny bit more ambition here than they've had before, which I really dig. Um, I really dig Pulse as a superb, nice, violent, head-splitting opening track, which I really dig. Uh, Blind Youth Industrial Park has finds the band kind of infusing some of those popular sensibilities from their earlier work, at least in terms of the way that the hooks are delivered on this track, but it still has this real pummeling quality that I love. Uh, the Mirror is even better, uh, at, at least uh, if it's full of their textbook discordant uh, but addictive melodies they kind of like ride the neck of the guitar like they play these really kind of like uh, scratchy and, and yowling tones that I kind of love uh, I, I really dig the se- the real tangible sense of doom in the way that they deliver and the way that the singer delivers, delivers the line feel the ground pull you down over and over and over towards the end of the track just really dig that uh, it's great shit uh, no Ceiling is a shorter and punkier rager that's appreciated at this point. And then Hail Taxi has a kind of more of that melodic edge to the energy. I mean, really, there's not a lot uh, of diversity in terms of things I can say about this record. Uh, it's all very much of a piece. And if you dig the sound of it, you'll have fun with it. Uh, and if you don't really dig the sound of it, then it'll probably be a bit of a slog. Uh, I do think there aren't really any low points, but... I feel like in the second half of the record, tracks six through eight specifically, uh, they, they do kind of feel like the band are on autopilot a little bit. They lack some of the spark and force of the record's first half. Uh, however, I think things pick up with the penultimate track, Parasite, which is kind of a little sh- on the shorter side, but has these really kind of uh, modest, mousy guitar tones that I think are really cool, like these kind of twangy, uh, unsettling tones that I really dig. Uh, give it a little bit more of a of a uh, a new kind of aspect to the palette of the record. Um, but really, what I love, what really sells this record for me, uh, what really keeps it from ending on a sour note, uh, is the sensational seven-minute closing track, "A Boat to Drown In," uh, which I think is one of the band's best songs. Again, it doesn't have us a lot of sort of complex complex shit happening in it. Um, but the melody is really strong and, and they really ride this extended uh, uh, breakdown in the second half of the track. It almost becomes hypnotic through the repetition and has this real kind of sense of edge to it. Uh, it almost reminds me of, of like Krautrock, uh, the, the beat does to a certain extent. Um, and the other comparison that it brought to mind as well is like the, the breakdown in, in Deer Hunter's song, Nothing Ever Happened. Uh, which is very similar to the breakdown in this track, although that song's a little bit more, a little bit more melodic than this one. But yeah, I really dig this. Uh, it has a lot of kind of energy that I love. Like I've already said it, basically. Um, like I said, there's not a lot to surpass here. Maybe not the best choice of album to review for this podcast for that reason. Although I, um, there wasn't a lot of like... Yeah, I mean, there's not much in the way of options at this moment. <laughs> there wasn't a terrible amount to choose from this week. Um, but mm. still, well, I'm glad I, we get to highlight it because it's yeah. Very I, good. I, I still dig this record. Like I, I, I don't think necessarily that the fact that I don't have a lot to pick apart in terms of content is a bad thing for th- in this instance because it's just this is like a pure. This band is just like pure id. You just put it on and it's like you just writhe in it. And I dig that. And I think they do a great job yeah. of it here. I was I was going to say almost exactly the same thing, which is this record is more built for 
visceral head banging in your car than deep analysis, you know. Yeah. And and that's valid. <laughs> like yeah. Um I uh, I think so I'm gonna be relatively brief, probably briefer than Tyler even. Um yeah, I, I enjoyed this record quite a bit. If I had one complaint, I have a nitpick later, but if I had one complaint about the broad record, it's just uh yeah, not a lot of sonic diversity. That's fine. They do what they do. And they're good at that. Um, just means sitting down to listen to the album. Uh, things can start to bleed in together. But they provide a lot of variety. And not one riff sounds like the other riff. Yeah. Uh, one one aspect of identity. one aspect I'll just bring up that I forgot to mention that I think may contribute to, uh, even though I like the record quite a bit, may contribute to the fact that it feels a bit bloated. This is the longest Mets album yet. Uh, and it's that is 40, not surprising. It's forty minutes long. Uh, their first two albums are both shorter than thirty minutes, uh, and and they benefit from the brevity. I think. Um, yeah, this so, definitely sounds like a thirty to thirty-five minute band. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah I agree with that. I um, so but I I don't. It's not as much of a complaint here as it was for me on Strange Peace, which was also closer to forty minutes because I dig the 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 longer parts of this record, like the Mirror and Boat to Drown, and I think are actually really strong um but i do think um the band do like do operate best like they did on their first couple records where it was just two three minute tracks that where they were just screaming their heads off and playing like louder than anything um so it's a different they're trying to uh, yeah i i don't know how much more mileage they can get out of the sounds but i'm always going to kind of be curious to turn up and see what they do i mean look um i listened to this album for the first time um, I had it queued up on my Spotify playlist, as I do IQ Up albums, and I just finished listening to Swans' Filth, and then this started. Um, and at first, for like the first song, I didn't really notice the change. Um, yeah, um, I, of course, Swans' Filth is, of course, more noisy and dirty, but I uh, would not be surprised if it was a point of inspiration, at least. I was uh, talking about some songs I particularly enjoyed. Uh, Blind Youth Industrial Park. It's one of the more bluesy cuts. Remind, the chorus reminded, reminded me a bit of like Queens of the Stone Age, actually, in some of the ways it's mixed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Hail Taxi uh, has a one and three snare beat, which um, I always find incredibly satisfying whenever it's used on a song. Um, and it's used very well here. It's slightly more melodic, and there's a breakdown I love. Uh, track seven, Sugar Pill. Also really enjoyed that. And uh, framed by the comet's tail, it's one of the more satisfying songs on the record, melodically. Um, yeah, and it goes straight into Barasite, which is just pure chaos. Um, I actually found a boat to drown in slightly tedious, um, to be honest, and I didn't think it should have been seven minutes long, um, but that's just me. Uh, mm-hmm. Does not take away from me, though, the overall visceral quality of the record i would just probably if i was doing it in a car i would just probably skip the next album three minutes sooner um but there we go <laughs> totally fear uh i went last last time so i'll go now um yeah i think this is a very strong album um if we weren't covering it on the show i probably wouldn't have listened to it so i mean personally i'm glad we're covering it <laughs> uh, because you know i got something out of it um but it, again not very much to say on it um this is clearly even even though this is the first record i've heard from them this is clearly to me a band that is doing what they do very well and they're doing it here um i i don't really have a problem with the lack of sonic diversity um what i have a problem with is that it just feels like the, the the something's wrong with the energy on you know tracks like uh like just ones on the back half really um i definitely do agree that parasite and uh about to drown in about to drown in being the strongest track here i think um definitely salvage the back half of the record in a big way um, because there's just once you hit the midpoint, yeah, you know, I feel like my attention starts to wane. Yeah, I feel and, the same. And on a on a f- album that's only forty minutes, that is not 
a good thing. Um, it's, as Tyler said, it just feels kind of on autopilot. Um, so I definitely think this could have been, could have benefited from some brevity, maybe make this eight tracks instead of 10. Um, but overall, this is very strong. It sounds great. Um, I like the writing, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the performances are stellar. Um, weirdly enough, it reminded me more of, uh, of post-punk than, uh, than noise yeah, rock same. in a lot of places, just mostly down to the, down to how cavernous it sounds. Yeah. I guess it's just really, you know, dirty and raucous, but it also sounds a bit like it's being played in the church um i don't know it's an atmosphere that i really dig which is the album's strongest selling point i believe just the atmosphere and the sound that it creates is excellent uh but there are parts of it that are just simply are not as good as the others and that is a shame um but yeah good good album good stuff Oh, okay. So, yeah, I find the opener here, uh, Pulse, really hard-hitting, really uh, pummeling. I love how the riff kind of just carries you through these uh, kind of instrumental swells and explosions. And uh, I, I just think it's an, a really engrossing opener. I find I find the writing on this album really bland i wouldn't take like i don't and i don't take a huge issue with it because it's clearly not what this album is putting up front as its main selling point like this is not an album where they want you to care about the specific meanings of every song and what every lyrics purposes i guess i just take a bit of an issue with it because i kind of feel the vocals were a bit higher in the mix, more present in the mix than I would have wanted them to be if that was kind of the vibe they're giving off. That yeah, and but all that being said, I was still not like terribly distracted by it. I was I was able for the most part to get into some a lot of the riffage, but uh I I just find the tracks on here that go on for like five eight minutes uh like the mirror hail taxi a boat to drown in and framed by a comet's trail to just they just drag on for me for so long because i don't find the kind of really i don't really get as much into this album's atmosphere as you all seem to i find it kind of garish and just sometimes and just yeah i don't really like the tone of a lot the kind of sound and tones and timbres of a lot of the instruments here but i do find that shorter cuts on here like no ceiling sugar pill and parasite to be the most engaging material on here because it it feels like something that just gets in gets out and it just punches you. It does exactly what I feel this album's primary goal was. It's just that that's not clearly the primary goal across most of this because, yeah, at a scant 42 minutes, it feels 10 minutes too long. Yeah, I just, I just wish it were a little shorter, but also... I, I'm glad it's not longer because it's in this perfect stage where I'm not fully engrossed by it, but I also don't really hate it. So that's about how I feel. Cool. Well, that's fair. Uh, I think yeah, all it's I like would... the atmosphere is garish and it's like Chad, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I know, I know I, what I, you I, mean. Uh, yeah. I'm just. Uh, that felt good, Morgan. Thank you. <laughs> All I would say uh, is uh, if I had to say any, any more on this band, I would say listen to their second album. It's called, mm -hmm. it's just called Two. Uh, and it's all the songs are like four minutes or less. The record's under 30 minutes and it just fucking slaps from start to finish. Yeah, that, that sounds like something I would enjoy more than yeah. this. Definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I do. 
as much as I do like a boat to drown and I feel like I would also definitely prefer um, the, uh, the just the get in, get out yeah. record that goes yeah. side of this yeah. band. Yeah. I, uh, they, they should form a cover band called the Met Singers. I, I, I fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got my first car in, in 2015. And like this, the second Mets album was just one of the albums that just happened to be coming out. And I just ended up being on rotation in the car the whole time. And it was like slap the roof of your car. And, 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 you know, just one of those bands that became associated with You can fit me. so many Mets albums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh my God. Definitely. I feel like you always remember the albums that you had on a lot the first time you get a car and yeah. you get your license. Mm-hmm. Mine was uh, yours was uh, I primarily remember uh, Coheed's and keeping secrets of Silent Earth three. Interesting connection here because there's an album that's been my kind of car album. uh, That's been the Strokes' new abnormal, which features a song called "Ode to the Nets." Interesting. Well, hey. Uh, another no, really... I'm, I'm getting my driver's license in February is one of my practical testers. Yeah, um, so it'll dumb. evidently be the next Stephen Wilson album. No, it won't. <laughs> no, <it's> another, <laughs> another really random uh, album that I just happened to be like really into at the same time I started driving uh, is Interpol's third album, uh, I'll, I'll Love to Admire, which I still maintain is uh, their second best album and very underrated. Um, but I just remember I have very distinct memories of playing the third Interpol album specifically in my car when I was like first like, oh, wow. listening to the Heinrich maneuver and just like, yeah, anyway, random aside. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I had uh, in Keeping Secrets and uh, Blackwater Park. On oh, yeah. Uh, of course you had like taste. That, that does sound Do Morgan. You had, you had, you had yeah. taste and I was listening to the just really yeah hey i mean interpol the tracks is good yeah interpol mm. is good are good we're good i know they catch criminals all over the planet and prosecute them um you know, you're gonna get prosecuted in a minute <laughs> yeah for that <laughs> um, I, I understood it was for that thank you yeah um, i know i know anyway. you understood which is why i said it to make it lame anyway okay. uh, tracks let, yeah let's do that uh, so we'll go backwards this time. I think August yes. decided we were going to. So I decided. Uh, uh, so my three favorite tracks on this record are uh, The Mirror, Hail Taxi, and A Boat to Drown In. Uh, mm-hmm. My least favorite track is one of the ones I don't have because I didn't write notes on it, probably. Um, I'll say Sugar Pill. Uh, I give this album a seven out of ten. Neat, um, neat, neat, neat by the people the who darned. made that song. The, yeah, then thank you. Um, <laughs> so my the, he- the heckin'. <laughs> God, so, so stupid. I'm remembering <laughs> the heckin' album now, and I'm not happy. Anyway, Blind Youth, Hail Taxi, and Framed by the Comet's Tail. Uh, my least favorite one is about to drown in. I'm giving the record a seven and a half out of ten. Sweet. Oh, that's me. Um, Indeed. My three favorites are about to drown in, uh, blind youth industrial park, and the mirror. Uh, least favorites, um, whatever. Whatever the one about like a, a comet's tail or oh, whatever. That one. Yeah. Framed by, by the, the comet's, comet's tail. tail. Yeah, that one. That one. Um, just, I don't remember it. <laughs> so, That's um, uh, seven out of ten. Um, three favorites are No Ceiling, Parasite, and Pulse. Uh, least favorite, I don't know, maybe Hail Taxi, uh, five out of ten. Okay. Glitching in and coming in oh. and out of existence, but you can so, read it. Yeah, yeah. so that's scoring yeah. a 6.6 6 out of ten overall. 
Good stuff. Um, uh, for context, uh, Napalm Death, no, uh, Fleet Foxes got a 6.7. Fantastic. So let us know, viewers at home, what you think of one or both of these albums. Uh, and please uh, stick around for our, uh, or go and check out our impending review of fucking Smash Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> fucking something or other, whatever. Mm. So, uh, phase. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's been that's been our episode. Thank you so much. And next week, oh yes, next week on our uh, main Ooh, episode, we're going to be episode. big week. We're going to be reviewing the new Orteker album, Sign, the new Open Mike Eagle album, Anime Trauma and Divorce. Uh, yeah. yeah, those are our two new reviews, and and we'll be uh, record clubbing uh, Square Pushers Ultra Visitor as well, which I'm looking forward By to. By Tyler's yeah. recommendation. Yeah, so stick around yeah. for that. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, rock over London. Rock, rock on Chicago. Chicago. Kleenex. Best care wherever you are. <laughs>